In this video, we're gonna be talking about some massive movements that have been going on in the NFT markets and how you can use this information to find hidden gems that have the potential to go to the moon. The first project that we are going to be talking about is going to be Azuki. And as you know, Azuki already hit the 31 ETH floor. I think it even got to 35 at one point. The Bobu Farmers at 0.247 and then the beans, the dirt that everybody got with the airdrop are at 5.672. And before what happened is they, they had like this crate that was flying in the sky and then it unloaded and then it was like a dirt and it was like, oh, April Fools. And everyone's like, okay, uh, do we have to use the bobo beans and combine it with the dirt? You know, what's going on? And then in the end, what they came up with is this little blue bean character, which is kind of funny actually. So they actually have a trailer over here of this little character doing little spray paints. Um, it's not clear what it's gonna look like. It kind of looks like a little bean character. Are they gonna have different variations like cool cat pets, for example? Are these beans gonna turn into something? It remains to be seen, but everyone's curious, everybody's on their toes and they're wondering if this is something they should buy. Now, if you look at Azuki, there's gonna be different tiers, right? There's a super expensive tier that's like 30 ETH. Now they got these little blue beans, which are about five ETH. And then you have the Bobu farmers, which are, you know, less than one of you, right? So they have an entry point for people who are just starting out, people who have a little ETH to spend, and people who are just massive whales who are willing to spend, you know, 30 ETH on a NFT. And for a long-term project to be successful, the name of the game, and it kind of is a Ponzi, and I mean, everything is a Ponzi at this point, right? But uh, I'm not saying Azuki is a Ponzi, but it's a Ponzi economics where the success of the project is determined by how many people they can onboard into the space, how many regular people they can get into NFT and buy their specific NFT versus anybody else because as people get more attention, the value of all the assets typically will increase because of that. And Azuki is doing an amazing job when it comes to mainstream brand marketing. Now, to be fair, they haven't really done much like technical innovations beside the ERC-721A smart contract, which reduced gas fees. But besides that, not really going on with the technology side, right? But on the other end, they're doing an amazing job with the marketing, just like how Board Ape Yacht Club did an amazing job with the marketing as well. So there definitely is value in creating intellectual property doesn't always have to be technical innovations like what CyberCons is doing. It can be just getting people together in a community and that itself is powerful because when you have the community, you can kind of sell them anything at that point. Next project that we're gonna be talking about is going to be one of my favorites, Nano Pass. And I spent some time with the founder uh, over at Jakarta during the Carnifru Festival and I really do believe in them long-term. And I talked about this on my channel when it was at 1.75 ETH. I said it was underrated. I said that they were building an ecosystem and that people were underestimating how valuable the Nano Pass will be because that would be the thing that connects everything in their ecosystem. And so not surprisingly, you know, the floor now is it's going to be 4.99, let's just call it 5 ETH to make it simple. But uh, yeah, for me, it was a kind of an obvious play when you listen to Ray and his long-term vision and their team's execution. So far, they've kind of been checking all the boxes. So why is Nano Pass pumping from, it was like 1.75, then it went from that to like 3 ETH, and then now it's like 5 ETH, right? Part of it is because when Izuki pumped, everyone started feeling more confident in the NFT space. Some people took profits and they rolled it into other projects. It's getting more attention on the news, so more and more people want to buy NFTs, right? So it's just, it comes in waves. It's, it's hot, then it's not. And right now it's hot, especially when it comes to the anime stuff because like anime culture, Asian culture, it's kind of running the scene right now um, in certain demographics. So it's a five Ethereum. If we look at IC tools, right, we see that it's kind of been steadily growing. And then just in the last, let's say week or so, it went from like 2.7 all the way to five. And it's just people FOMOing in. It's it's two things, right? One is that like people are trading based on narrative where, you know, they know that there's gonna be a free uh, phase two drop. So they're gonna buy the nano pass. They're gonna wait until right before the drop. They're gonna sell it to the next guy for a maximum profit. And then they don't care what happens after. So that typically happens quite a lot. Other people are like, I love the nano pass. I wanna be a holder. So they're gonna say like, okay, if I'm gonna buy it, now's the time because it's cheap and I'm gonna get the free phase two. So I'm gonna hold the nano pass and I'm gonna get a phase two, and then hopefully I can get whitelist for PXN, right? And so there are people that are believers and holders, so you have people who are flippers, but when you combine the believers and the flippers, everything just goes crazy. And I think, you know, all that is a perfect storm to get the nano pass to a five ETH floor. You know, with that said, let's go ahead and talk about the Phantom Network, Project PXN, right? This has been extremely hyped right now. They have over 200,000 followers on Twitter. I think even Nanoverse only has 200,000 followers, so that's pretty crazy. And as you can see, the R is pretty good. It's kind of like that Asian Valorant League legend style combined with uh, like tech wear, which is very a popular niche. Yeah, as you can see here, very tech wear inspired. Like if you go on Pinterest, you type in like anime tech wear, you're gonna see like a whole slew of this kind of art. So one thing that I really appreciate about this uh, team is that they really understand how to find a target demographic that is starving for what they want, right? So, you know, before, Project PXN, there wasn't really like anime tech wear PFP project, right? So this market already existed outside of NFTs and all they really had to do was say, oh, 
outside of NFTs, this is super popular. Let's just make an NFT about it and then people will spend money on it, right? So it's like very good positioning, very good timing, first mover advantage. So the team is definitely smart in that. And I can see like with NFT keys, which is their other project, it's the same thing. It's just like these people are already spending a ton of money on keyboards. Let's just make an NFT version of it, right? So I can predict or guess that for the nano verse ecosystem, they're gonna do that over and over. They're gonna look for niches that are underserved, that are big markets outside of NFTs. They're gonna create the first NFT for that niche and bring everybody in. If they can do that like 10 times in a row, then they have the potential to be like one of the biggest uh, ecosystems in, in the entire space. So that's why I'm pretty bullish on nano pants overall, uh, mainly for their marketing and business savviness. And to give you a further illustration of like how this kind of works and how, I'm, how my eye is seeing it, like if you look at the game Arknights, right? which is a very popular game, uh, especially in Asian countries, uh, you see it's basically just a tower defense game. So we type in like Art Knights on Pinterest, right? You can kind of see it's like this anime waifu kind of vibe, but then everyone's wearing like these oversized jackets and they got weapons and swords and things like that. Or if you type in like, let's say like anime tech wear, that's like another one. And you're gonna see like this style over here, right? Like this is a popular style that people already like and all they're doing is taking what already exists and they're putting it into a NFT project, right? And obviously they have their own spin, their own style, they take different references, but it's like, it's just marketing. It's just, where's the cyber market? How can we give them something that they already want? And then we don't even have to do any paid marketing because this is, they're starving for it, right? And like, here's another like random example. So like, if we're talking about like animes and NFTs, right? So there's an entire niche, like I guess it's like otaku niche of like um, people that collect anime figures. So like these anime figures, people pay hundreds of dollars, sometimes thousands of dollars for these anime figures. And they're kind of based off of popular anime, right? And this whole market for this, right? Multi-million dollar market. And there's also a game like on your iPhone and Android where you collect these figures and then they battle each other in like this idol battler type of system, right? So like people pay a lot of money for this kind of hobby, this niche, people like this kind of vibe. So like when I see, let's say somebody create a uh, anime figurine uh, NFT project, I'm gonna buy that one, right? And I don't really collect these figures, but I know that other people collect these figures. I know they spent a lot of money on it. I know that there are YouTube channels, Reddit, Discords that are dedicated to this niche. So when I see someone attack a niche or go for a niche where it's underserved, not many people wanna go for it, but they really have the culture and they understand how to make a product for this audience, that's gonna be a hit, right? So that's kinda like what I'm looking for, where I'm trading more on, it, or I'm trading and investing more on culture, you know? Like what are things that people are really into? What are they willing to spend money on? And when I see opportunities like like this, so like someone creates anime figures, like outside looking in, you might be like, who would pay for like a sexy anime figure as an NFT, that doesn't make any sense. But then when you're in the culture and you understand, you're like, oh, I get it, people will pay thousands of dollars for this. So that's that's the game you play and you gotta find your advantage, whatever it may be, right? So like for me, I'm a fan of anime, so when I see anime stuff, Asian inspired stuff, I can tell what's good, what's not. But if you're into like basketball or if you're into fine art, whatever, right? What's your edge that you can have when it comes to NFTs and that's where you make the outsized returns. And speaking of anime inspired inspired picture profiles. As you guys know, I have a Discord parallax where I've been giving a lot of alpha as well as some sneak peeks on a special project that we have been working on. Not gonna leak anything on this video quite yet, but if you want to know, make sure to join our Discords because we're gonna start to do live AMAs um, and you can ask questions on how you might be able to get something uh, during the Discord. So make sure to check that out. Link is in the description. Follow me on Twitter and then let's move on to the next story. Now, when it comes to alpha, right? A lot of times people will follow you know, other traders, right? And I do that myself. I have a list of wallets that I follow and when they buy something, I'm like, hmm, why did they buy it? But another strategy you can use is looking at who are the really big players in the space and kind of have a copy trade or follow them, right? So one example of that would be A16Z, which is Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the most successful venture capital firms in the entire world in Silicon Valley and everywhere, right? So they invested in companies like Asana, Box, these are exited Lyft, uh, Samsara, uh, Zanga, Roblox, Coinbase. Like this is a investment company with an amazing track record. They got infinite money. They got billions of dollars and they have a bunch of connections, right? So when we look at this kind of company, we're like, okay, so they're in the traditional tech VC world. How does this relate to NFTs? Well, if you look at the companies that they invested in, and let's talk about like some of the biggest projects in NFTs. Well, NFT startup Artifact Studios raises 8 million in seed funding by A16Z. This is before the Nike acquisition. So if you knew that, you knew that the track record of this company was hot and they invested $8 million in the Artifact, you're like, well, the price of Artifact stuff 
is not that expensive right now, or maybe it didn't, I think at the time it didn't even mint yet. So you're like, okay, if I buy this artifact thing, at least I have the backing of one of the most successful VC companies in the world with the connections to the most powerful people in the world. So chances are this might be successful, right? Versus buying a random project from a random nobody, like which one would you rather have if they're the same floor price? You would rather go with the company that has $8 million from the most successful VC company, right? Um, another project that A16Z invested in is Yuga Labs. So when everyone's talking about like, oh my God, like Yuga Labs raised $450 million led by A16Z once again, right? And they're killing it. And so value at 4 billion. So it's like when you're buying these projects that have the backing of large companies, it's like kind of a no brainer where, you know, if you have the risk return ratio, you might as well go with the company, like the super corporate company that's gonna do everything legal. They're gonna pay all their taxes. They have all the right connections. Why not invest in that team versus the random anonymous person, right? And so moving forward, I'm gonna be watching A16Z. You know, what is the next metaverse project that they're gonna invest in? If they buy a stake in NanoPass, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna buy a bunch more NanoPasses, right? Or if they buy a stake in Cool Cats, for example, I might be like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe they can pull off another Yuga Labs with Cool Cats, right? Um, they didn't do those things. I'm just saying hypothetically, right? So I, from now moving forward, I'm gonna look at who are the best investors in the world, right? Just period. And then if, when they invest in NFT projects, I'm gonna pay a very close attention because, you know, I'd rather have my money right with them because they did all the due diligence for me and they're gonna take it to the next level, hopefully. And to really hammer this home, let's look at one more project that is, has huge investments from a large VC. So that's gonna be Proof Collective. I remember when I was looking at this, it was only a couple of Ethereum. And you know, when I started my NFT journey, the first, the person that really got me into it was uh, Kevin Rose. I would listen to his podcast, Proof, basically, and then I would learn about NFTs that way, right? Like the interviews with the founders and stuff. And I didn't end up buying one of these, but I should have because the floor right now is like 68 ETH. So why is it so expensive? Well, the first of all, you have to understand that True Ventures, which is a venture firm that has raised billions and invested over $2 billion into 300 teams, they are basically like Kevin Rose is part of this team. And then Kevin Rose started Proof as a way to do like to seed venture deals, right? Because people know who they are, more people want their money because they can help them out. So for True Ventures, if you think about it, True Ventures is directly backing Proof Collective, right? Again, billion, multi-billion dollar VC firm getting into NFTs. And then why do people want this uh, NFT particularly? Because Kevin Rose is like an OG. Uh, everybody wants to be around him. He has those connections. So like this is a group of like a thousand people where they're all like supposedly super rich VC kind of tech people, right? And so you pay a lot of money to be in that room. And so that's why the floor price, is, in my opinion, is so high because it's a connection you make from those thousand people. So like, again, like this is the same trend happening over and over. Where's the big money putting their money? And uh, as the little guys, which is us, I guess, or maybe some of you guys are whales, like how can you kind of see that and kind of follow it? And then when you you know make a bet on an investment or a trade, your risk to reward ratio is a lot better because you know, you're know you not just you know making a guess on your own based on your own experience. You are kind of looking at what people with like billions of dollars are doing and, and kind of copying them a little bit, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. And so those are the lessons that I've been learning over the past few months. Uh, I wish I had bought this, but you know, moving forward, when I see like another venture firm that I respect and they have a good personality in the front, if they come out with an NFT project and it's gonna be a very exclusive club and they have very limited quality, well, maybe I'm gonna spend two ETH to buy that, right? So those are the things that I'm personally thinking about. Next thing we're gonna talk about is Carl Fru. So this is really interesting because, you know, I know a lot of you guys have bought Carl Fru since I made that last video. Uh, right now, you know, during that video, the floor was like 1.9, now it's 2.5, right? So it's quite a big jump since my last video. And to, you know, something I found really interesting is that when we look at the sales from Carl Fru, let's go last 30 days on OpenSea, right? We dropped the video around around April 1st on according to OpenSea, right? And so the volume for that day, usually they get like 20 sales, 17 sales, and then all of a sudden they got 60 sales the next day, which is the same day I dropped the video, and then it went back to 38, and then now it pumped up to 54, uh, and then 23. So like, it's pretty crazy. I'm not saying that it was because of my video that, you know, they got like an additional 40 more sales, but I definitely have seen a lot of people message me on Twitter. A lot of people have messaged me on Discord and said, I bought a car for you because you were so bullish on it during that video, right? And so that's just the power of narrative, right? And not, not just speaking on car for you, but like, you know, any project that I feel, you know, has a good team and they're doing something right, if I make a video on them, is it possible that the price might pump? Probably, right? Because that's what being an influencer is all about. Um, but if your intention is in the right place and you really believe in the project long term and for me I'm holding power through and I'm, I'm trying to buy more to be honest if I can look 
with it, some stuff. Yeah, man, it, it's kind of great for everyone. And I just, it just, for me, it's like, I'm pretty new to this influencer thing when it comes to NFTs. So like when these kind of things happen or like when people buy something because of something I said, it's it's quite crazy to be honest, right? Like someone spent like $6,000 on a car food because they watched a video. I always try to do right by you guys, you know, like the things that I personally recommend are the things that I buy myself. So just keep that in mind. And you know, I'm not the type of person that would try to pump and dump on you uh, because why would I do that? Because it's just, that would just kill my reputation, right? But overall, I think what's gonna happen with Carfu is that because it's all, it's all about narrative, right? So like Carfu has a solid team, they have a solid company, they're competent, they create great work, um, and they're just underrated, I feel. And I think the reason why the floor price dropped to like 1.8 is because they didn't have a great way to explain their narrative, right? They weren't really thinking about like, okay, like this is a concise message that we're gonna put out. This is our spokesperson. They're gonna go on all these interviews and they're gonna tell the story. And so for me, when I told the story, obviously people buy, they get more confident. And if I articulate it in a very clear way, then they kind of spread the word. Now for me, you know, when I created that story, it was only because I hung out with the Carl Fu team in person myself and I asked them these questions. Like I'm literally asking them like, you know, what's your long-term vision? What's this partnership gonna look like? Like, why do you do this this way, right? And so all the information that I put into the video, that's what they told me themselves. So it's not like they don't have a story, it's that they don't know how to take their raw material and turn it into a story that people can share. And so what I look for in the teams is like, do they have a solid team? Are they gonna be successful anyways? And the last piece they need to do is just shift their story so that it creates a better narrative. That's the team I'm gonna invest in because once they shift that narrative, then everything skyrockets because it just makes sense. Especially because if they have 3D project coming out, everyone, like, dude, the 3D project, I think people are sleeping on it. Um, like, it's kind of worth it. It's just buy car fruits, so just so you can get the whitelist or the free mint for the uh, 3D project, in my opinion. Again, not financial advice, but that's kind of like what I'm doing. But yeah, so I think car fruit, I think it's a solid hold to hold car fruit itself, to hold the 3D project, because I think they're gonna go places in the long run. We've seen what happened to Nanopass, where things blew up once they have a good narrative going on. Again, it's narrative, right? It's not even, nothing new has to happen. It's just people start to believe the market gets hot, and that's what it is. You can trade that narrative and, and sell it at the high, right? Or you can just hold it and if you believe in a long term, really up to you, depends on your strategy, but um, that's kind of like what I'm thinking about. And the last project of the day that we're gonna be talking about is CyberCogs, right? And as you guys know, I'm a big fan of CyberCogs. I hold a lot of babies, I hold a lot of VX, and you know, right now the price is, is tanking, right? It was like 7.5 and now it's five. And then for VX, uh, it was at like, let's say like two Ethereum and now it's like 1.15. And so it, it's it, the thing is like CyberCon is a good community. They are innovators, but I feel like they haven't been crafting their story that well, especially because the play to collect game wasn't that fun for the average person. And there's more competition in the space as well. And everyone's trying to capture this attention. But I think because they have a solid team, they have good intentions. I think the long term looks really bright. I feel that what they need to do moving forward is really craft that narrative to give people a reason to be onboarded into CyberCon's, right? And so they did that party with FaZe Clan. That's one example of like getting that mainstream appeal. Um, I think before CyberCongs was trying to be like the Bentley style of marketing where they're kind of cool and people that know that know. Uh, but at the same time, like if you're too cool for school, you can't onboard new people, right? And so now I feel like they're trying to do a little bit of a mix where they're trying to be more active on Twitter. All the followers, all the holders of CyberCongs are trying to be more active and friendly and trying to onboard new people instead of trying to be too cool for school. So if they're able to pull it off, then I think this pricing can kind of reverse, um, especially because their play to earn mechanics are, you know, pretty top notch when it comes to like, uh, you know, idol, idol style kind of games and creating value. Um, but I think they really just gotta create that story for the average regular person who's gonna buy an NFT with their credit card on OpenSea. They gotta capture that person's attention. If they're able to do that, then I can see this kind of going up. And at five ETH for a baby, that's pretty cheap. Like four, if it ever gets a four ETH or three ETH, that's like a steal in my opinion, because that's like way too low for a CyberCon baby, to be honest, especially because they are producing some passive income for the babies. Um, the VX does produce income as well, not as much. But yeah, that's just something I'm personally looking at. You know, what is the narrative play? Is it their solid team? If, if they can change the marketing, you know, can it explode? Yeah. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Follow me on Twitter and I will see you guys in the next one.